Well, I'll invite you to open in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 3. If we can get the lights on, that'd be fantastic. Um, my name is Omar Garcia. I'm the pastor of worship and evangelism, if you're visiting. Um, our senior pastor, David Adams, is spending some much-needed family time, and, uh, and we're thankful for his leadership, thankful that he has uh, been able to get away and to spend time with his family. So Acts chapter 3, be praying for him as he's out this week and gets to come back next week and share. And so um, Thanksgiving is just a few days away. It is one of my most favorite times of the year. Raise your hand if you're with me. Amen. So my wife is a first grade teacher here in Pearland, and they gave their students assignments this week to write some things that they're thankful for. And a lot of them were just uh, ones that you would expect. You know, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my brother or my sister. One little girl said, I'm thankful for my toothbrush so I can have my teeth clean. I was like, man, I appreciate that little girl. That's when you're good. Um, all other kinds of things being thankful for. And then my wife just said, and there was one little boy that said that he was thankful for turkey. And I was like, man, that's, that's a good little boy right there. She said, but he didn't say it just, write it down just one time or two times or three times. He wrote he was thankful for turkey six times. I was like, man, that, that's a good boy. She said, Omar, that is your son that wrote that, uh, Eli. And I was like, that is a boy after my heart. Love that man. So um, I love Thanksgiving. I love turkey. I love to eat. So, um, but as I've thought about this week, what is, what is Omar thankful for? And I don't want to sound super spiritual. I'm not trying to be holier than thou at all, but I, I'm just being completely honest. I am most thankful for my relationship with Jesus Christ. There is nothing in this world that even compares to the closeness of him in my life and what it's, what it's done for me. And I hope that's your story as well. But the unfortunate thing is that we live in a world where there are many people who cannot say that. They cannot say they're thankful for the relationship with Jesus. In Acts chapter 3, there's a story about two men who go out of their way to reach a young man, to reach a person. And this morning, I think that we can take some insights from these two men, how they uh, were not scared to go and to reach uh, this man. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says this. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a crippled man from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with him into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. If you go back to the beginning of this passage, it says that they were on their way to prayer. Uh, for about two years, a few years ago, um, I would get together with a group of guys. We'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning on Friday, and we'd head to the church, and we'd be on our knees sometimes on our face, in prayer. And uh, we prayed for a solid hour. And you can imagine getting up at 4.30. At that time, I was taking online classes. So I was going to bed late, getting up early. Um, it was hard to roll out of bed. But when I got into my car, I became excited. I thought, man, I can't wait to go and hang out with my brothers. I can't wait to hear what God's been doing in their life. I can't wait to just pray with them. And so there was this expectation of just being together with brothers in Christ and talking to the Lord. And I think about um, 
just, just that, that heart and that mindset, it, it changed how um, I looked, it changed how I viewed the world. And so if you're taking notes, we need to be a people of prayer. Um, prayer changes how we see the world. A few years ago, uh, we took the boys to an IMAX theater movie. It was 3D. I think it was dolphins or fish or something. And uh, my third son, Eli, was young, had a smaller face, and those 3D glasses don't usually fit real well. And so about five minutes into the video, he just takes them off and says, Dad, they're falling off. I can't see. Well, I felt sorry for him, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to take my glasses off, and we're going to watch it in a blind way together. Well, five minutes in, I started getting a headache. Like, you can't really see the picture clearly at all. You see three of everything. Um, but it's so cool when you put the glasses on. Man, it's a whole different world. And I think Peter and John recognized that when they're in prayer, when they're spending time with the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, it changed how they saw the world. It changed how they saw who was around them. It became clearer, and there was a focus now that it wasn't on them, but it was on what they were looking at. Prayer not only changes how we see the world, it changes how we feel about the world. When Jesus was with a bunch of people, thousands of people, he knew that they were hungry, and Scripture says that he had compassion on them. That word compassion in the Greek means that his stomach was in knots. Like, he loved them and cared for them so much that he wanted to fix their need, and it was to provide food for them. Now, Scripture doesn't say Peter and John had compassion on this man, but we can tell by their actions that, man, they loved him and they cared enough to just stop to help change this man's life. It changes how we see the world, it changes how we feel about the world, and it changes how we spend our time in the world. Again, I'm sure Peter and John had a schedule just like you and I. And on their way, they were thinking, man, we're gonna get to prayer, we got these things to do afterwards. But they didn't let this opportunity passed because I believe they were excited. They were already in the state of prayer as they were going to pray. They were thinking and longing for that connection and God, I wanna be close to you. I wanna be with you. I can't wait to communicate with you in a special and divine appointment. Be with us. And that prayer, I think, changed their whole perspective on the world. Second thing is we need to be ready. Um, I know that seems elementary. I know it seems... Um, I'm having a lot of ringing. Can y'all hear that? Um, I know it seems like uh, being ready is kind of an elementary thing, but I think there are things in life that prevent us from being ready, and one of those things is just being tired, being tired. How many of you are tired before 8 a.m. hits most times? Just be honest. Uh, in our household, uh, we've got about, how many shoes, 14 shoes we have to find? Um, we have to make sure that seven teeth, mouths are brushed, um, at least four diapers are changed, lunch is made. I mean, it is, it is an act of Congress to get up in the morning in the Garcia household. If you're visiting, we have five boys, uh, so you can imagine how, how long it takes, but it can be tiring, it can be exhausting. Um, and I don't know what Peter and John are doing before or after, but I can imagine that there are times in their life that they just feel exhausted, that they're tired. Um, Another thing that we feel is, is kind of rushed, and I think Tracy hit the nail on the head when she was working. She felt like they were rushed trying to get people in and out, and there was no time um, to really connect with anyone. This past week alone, on Wednesday morning, getting the boys ready, and I walked out the door and um, come in here to drop off my two little ones off, and I'm holding one, and I'm holding diaper bags, and I realize that my pants are starting to slip down, and I forgot to put my belt on, so I'm trying to, like, walk in and, you know, trying to act all weird and uh, make my pants fall off, but I forgot to put my belt on. Like, I was just rushed, and the next day, I was trying to get out of the house again and got all the way to work, and I pulled out, tried to pull out my phone and realized I left it on the counter. Um, you know what I'm talking about. We are sometimes exhausted, we're tired, we're rushed, we've got a thousand things we've gotta be doing. Peter and John, I don't think that they were that because they didn't miss this chance, they didn't miss this opportunity. Maybe um, you're gonna relate more to this, but maybe we're sometimes angry. Um, our anger, something might have happened that morning or that day, 
and it really took us off task. It took us off the focus of the Lord. And imagine with me for just a moment, I know it's just kind of silly, but um, I'm going to kind of read the story in a different light, okay? So just pretend that uh, Peter and John were on their way to prayer. And as they were walking up the stairs, Peter stubbed his toe on the top stair, causing him to tumble, fall down. John then falls. They both fall flat on their face. Angry and frustrated, they get up. They walk towards the prayer area, and they see a beggar. And the beggar says, hey, do you have some money? To which Peter and John say, you lazy bum, go find someone to give you money. Go ask, I mean, go ask, go ask for work. Uh, you can sew, you can do something. Tell someone to bring you some, some work. Well, I, I can't walk because my legs are broken. Well, that's no excuse. Someone can bring it to you. Get away from me. Now, I'm thankful that's not how the story was read. But I think that we can relate to a place where when we are called by God and God has given us a task and God has given us an opportunity and something in our life triggers our mind to go south or to be frustrated, we lose sight. I'm confident if that story really had happened that way, he fell, fell on their flesh when they got up, they still would have ministered to this man because of their closeness and because of their love for Jesus. Man, I hope, I hope that's Omar. <laughs> I hope I don't let anything or circumstance in my life miss for me having an opportunity with sharing the love and the power of Jesus. Third thing, we need to be honest uh, with what we don't have. I think sometimes we give advice to people and it's, it's often the wrong advice. How many times have you heard someone say, um, just follow your heart? Just raise your hand. Have you heard that word, just follow your heart? Yeah. Yeah. I hope none of us in this room have said that to someone or given that advice. Um, it, is, it is probably the worst advice we could give someone because our hearts, the Bible says, are full of wickedness and of evil. And, and I wanna encourage you, when someone's struggling or someone needs help, would you just encourage them to follow the Lord? <laughs> Ask them to follow God. God, what is it that you want from me in this season? It's difficult, it's hard, I don't understand, but I, I need some help. Follow the Lord, not your heart. And I think we sometimes give advice to people just because we want ourselves to sound wise or that we wanna sound good when we talk to people. And we're not really thinking about the other person. We're just trying to make ourselves sound good. And I'm thankful Peter and John didn't do that. He didn't lie to them, he said, look, I know you need this money, but I don't have anything to give you. I don't have money, I don't have silver, but what I do have, they were honest with, and that's power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy mackerel, I wanna be living a life in such a way that, man, I'm honest with everything I say. Nothing comes off of my lips that is not truthful or that is not building up the kingdom of, of, of the Lord, and I'm not building up and encouraging people. We have got to be honest with what we have and what we, we, with what we don't have. We need to be giving, we need to be willing to give what we have. I asked a few volunteers to come up and if you could come up right now, that'd be fantastic. Take them a second. I love Christmas time, so I took some candles from the candlelight service time, so we're gonna play with fire. I mean, we're gonna... We're gonna do something cool. Hold that for me. Hold that for me. Hold that. I'll hold this one. We stand right there, just kind of in a line right there. Great, it's awesome. So, do you have some money in your pocket? How much money do you have? 120 bucks, and it's in 20s, right? Okay. I want you to take out the 120 bucks. I want you to give it to me. Thank you. You can go back and have a seat. Just kidding, not really. All right. So, I'm going to. I'm going to give 60 uh, to Chelsea. There you go. And I'm going to give 60 to Grace. Awesome. Do you feel good about yourself? <laughs> he doesn't. Sometimes when God is calling us to give something, 
it is money. Sometimes it's material. Sometimes uh, it's difficult to let go of something we have because when we give it away, it doesn't return, right? So do you have 120 bucks in your hand anymore? No, because he gave it, and now they have it, and he no longer has it. So it was a sacrifice. He had to give something away. But what's good about the Lord and it, what Peter and John did, they gave something that never goes away. And so this candle is going to represent just the Lord in our lives and the power and the gospel that he has given us. And so now, you can hold on to that. Just kidding. I'll give it to you, Grace. And so when Grace is filled with the power of the Lord and, and full with the power of the Spirit, she has been commanded to give that away. And when she gives it, did anything go away from her candle? Nothing. It's still bright. You can still see it. And now she's a recipient of God's power and grace, and she shared that with her, and now she has the full story that she has. And now when she shares it with Ethan, did hers diminish or go small or burn out? It still has the power to change and to move. And I think it's, it's kind of mind-blowing to me that when we give money, it's difficult. But when God says, Omar, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, I want you to go and tell them about my son, Jesus, and I'm gonna give you the power to do it. So do it. We don't. <laughs> we don't. Give these guys a round of applause. You can blow it out. Um, can, I ha can I have the money? Because I gotta eat this afternoon. <laughs> awesome, good job, guys. Put it right there. Good job, good job, good job. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we have to be willing to give what we have. We have to be willing to lend a hand. Growing up, my mom and dad were very um, clean people. So uh, my mom had like a big fanny pack always with like wet ones and antibacterial soap. And I mean, it was, it was nauseating. It was embarrassing, really. Um, and so I grew up, even at four years old, washing my own clothes. Like I would jump onto the laundry, pull it out, throw it in. It was, it was embarrassing. But uh, I grew up just trying to be clean. And I know we went on our first mission trip to Mexico. And I was scared to touch anything because I thought everything was dirty. And uh, my mind was thrown off because my mom raised me weird. But um, I just, I remember thinking, I don't want dirtiness in the world's eyes to prevent me from touching or connecting with anyone. And in today's society, if you think of a beggar, you don't really think of them as a well-put-together individual or one that is clean and, and, and smells good. In fact, I think it's the opposite. It's usually someone who probably smells a little bit or, or doesn't look like they've bathed in days. And I don't, know, I don't know what this man looked like when Peter and John came up to them, but I can imagine he probably wasn't well-put-together. He was an afterthought to most of the people. But... Peter, Scripture says he actually reached out his hand and grabbed him. Man, what does that look like for us today? I don't come across a lot of beggars. I don't come across a lot of homeless people in my day in and day out. But I think maybe we together come across people who are broken, maybe not physically, but in their heart, and lending a hand and saying, you know, um, I'm here for you. How can I be praying for you? Again, she just asked, how can I be praying? And salvation happened from that. I know a lot of you remember the story earlier in January when I was witnessing to that, to that waitress. I mean, God really showed up in this young lady's life just because, hey, how can I pray for you? We've got to be willing to lend a hand. We've got to be willing to be close to people and not hesitating. Number six, we need to be willing to include everybody. There's a video that has been playing for a while, and it's called Strangers, and I think it's a perfect picture of what it looks like when we're faithful to go and communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet, oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. How is this possible? Well, let's take a look. 
Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's so they were walking out of the coffee shop, and it just says that it's weird how they've come connected together, but they've never really met. And I just think about, you know, Billy Graham. We all know his story and his life, and somebody shared the gospel of Jesus with him. And I promise you, the person that shared that story of Jesus never thought in their wildest dreams that this man would go and reach thousands of people for the Lord and you have no idea who God is putting in your path who you're supposed to share love and share the gospel of Jesus with and how God can use that individual to reach thousands or thousands of people God has given us a command not suggestions to go and make disciples of nations and then reach them to, to baptize them and to teach them everything he's commanded um, it was not a thought, it is a command because he's got a divine plan and a purpose for them. Number seven, uh, we just need to be bold. I love Peter and John as, as they're walking up to this man. There is absolutely no hesitation in their approach to him. They were bold with their language. Listen to what they say. Um, Taken by the hand. Or he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, I've never been able to do that. Like, I've never been able to walk to someone and heal them and, and watch a miracle happen. But in their mind and their heart, they believed in the power of Jesus because they were with him. And there was no hesitation like, oh, man, I hope if I tell this guy to get up, he's actually going to get up and walk because that, that would be a miracle because <laughs> he's been here forever. From birth, that's what he's been. But they were bold with how they, they approached this man, and they were bold with their expectations. They knew that when we talked about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his name, it wasn't in the name of John, it wasn't in the name of Peter. Pause for just a moment and think about Peter and John, if you were in their shoes. 
and you told someone to get up and walk that had been <laughs> broken from birth, and it actually happened. Holy mackerel, right? <laughs> like, man, I just told that guy to walk, and he's walking now. And not only that, he's jumping up, his ankles are healed, and now he's running. <laughs> I think, just personally, I think I'd get a little big head and think, dude, man, I just did that. Like, I spoke it, and it happened. I think it's a real, a real uh, distraction that maybe they could have faced, but they knew where their help and they knew where their power came from, and it was in the name of Jesus Christ. And this man walked, and so they were, they were on point with their language. They were on point with their expectations of what would happen. So this whole story... It's just 10 verses. So much has happened in this place. And, um, and I want you to see the results of this story. Um, someone's life was changed forever. Um, physically. This guy was made new. He was made perfect. Um, his physical appearance changed forever. Um, his attitude about life changed. Um, back in verse 8. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking, jumping, and praising God. Man, his attitude went from, woe is me, to, man, check me out. <laughs> Look what God did in my life. And his direction changed. Um, his direction was no longer just sitting and waiting and hoping for the best. His direction was, man, I got to show people what God has done in my life. God has made a difference. And I want the world to know this. Um, and because of that, there was an influence he had um, that most people didn't. Um, he was able to influence around uh, those people in the temple courts. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Man, this guy's influence now is completely different, and it's all for the better. My hope for, for First Baptist Church Pearland is that we would be men and women who would take seriously the command of Jesus Christ to go and make disciples, to be faithful, to be vocal about the power and the love that Jesus Christ has poured out so freely. We've already seen that it doesn't take anything away when we share it. It's all day long right there with us and in great power. Peter and John were men of prayer, which changed how they saw the world, how they felt about the world, how they spent their time in the world. They were ready to be used by God at any moment. They were honest with what they had. They were willing to give what they had, and it was power in the name of the Lord Jesus. Be willing to give a hand. They were willing to include everybody. And they were 100% bold. Man, I, I promise if, if we can just look at these guys and we can be a reflection of this truth, I promise God's kingdom would grow, not just numerically, but in, in power. God, I thank you for Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 10. Um, God, it is, it is humbling to me that you desire to use any one of us to try to advance your kingdom as broken and as, as hurting as we are. Um, you still choose to use us. So God, as we, as we think about this passage, as we think about this truth, um, help us to be ready. Help us to be men of prayer. Help us uh, to speak truth, to be honest with what we have. Um, God, help us to not be scared or timid when you lead us to communicate your truth, but help us to have the boldness that Peter and John had and that we can um, rejoice. God, at the end of that passage, you were worshiped because of what you had done. God, we want more stories of people coming to salvation in your son, Jesus. God, we need you more than ever and we're thankful for your availability to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us as.